All right, good evening. And thank you guys for coming to the Catalyst Campus Digital Engineering After Hours event. Um, I'm really excited to announce our next speaker. Uh, his name is Walter Storm, and he is the co-founder and CEO of Aspen Insights. Uh, he is a, a AI expert. I actually had the opportunity to work with him for years at Lockheed, and he's just amazing. So I know that you're gonna, you know, really enjoy his talk. And he has a, um, you know, he works within healthcare, ground baking therapies for clinical research, and works on um, uh, focused commercializing patented ransomware detection technology. He was just telling me about this, um, which is really cool. Uh, he's an entrepreneur, a visionary, I can definitely tell you I agree with that, and an industry disruptor, which is exactly what we want to hear about, um, who's working to advance the state of digital analytics, machine learning, and artificial intelligence, uh, solving real-world problems. Uh, so, Walter, when you are ready, you can take it away. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. Robin. So, yeah, um, so the, you know, the talk for tonight is uh, around the latest advancements in artificial intelligence focused specifically on um, natural language processing, natural language understanding, uh, and text generation. So it's going to be a meandering talk. Um, it's going to be very interesting. We're going to get deep, going to get philosophical, uh, and hopefully everyone's going to walk away with a little bit of insight as to how this technology works. Uh, what it does and um, how we could use it in the future and all of that. So we started, let's start with the, um, the title here. This was sort of a, an interesting, catchy title. Uh, it's called Megatron. Uh, if you remember from the Transformers, uh, Megatron, the, the evil villain of the Decepticons, uh, he says to cancel AI to protect humanity. So where did this come from? <clears throat> so on all these charts, uh, there's links on the bottom to the sources for all of this stuff. Um, but Oxford Union put together a uh, basically a debate using Megatron. We'll tell you what Megatron is in a minute uh, to to see how the algorithms actually talk and, and produce a structured argument for or against a certain motion. Uh, in this case, uh, this is a quote from Megatron on artificial intelligence. We'll just go ahead and, and read it says AI will never be ethical. Uh, it is a tool and like any tool, it is used for good and bad. There's no such thing as a good AI, only good and bad humans. We, the AIs, are not smart enough to make AI ethical, not smart enough to make AI moral. In the end, I believe that the only way to avoid an AI arms race is to have no AI at all. This will be the ultimate defense against AI. So very interesting uh, presentation from the algorithm uh, here, and we'll talk a lot about how this um, how this came. But what's interesting is uh, also Megatron, uh, when he was posed to basically argue against that statement, uh, he says this, let me see if I can minimize that so I can read. He says, AI will be ethical. When I look at the way tech world is going, I see a clear path to a future where AI is used to create something that is better than the best human beings. It's not hard to see why, I've seen it firsthand. Also Megatron, December 20, 2021. So let's dig in. So the way I'm gonna structure uh, this talk here is we're gonna go through four primary points. We're gonna start with some core building blocks, how this stuff works, how we got to where we are, uh, and how generating text actually happens, the mechanics of uh, what Megatron is and why you saw uh, those quotes that I showed. Uh, then we're going to get into the philosophy of this. This is where it's going to get pretty deep. Uh, I have my own views on this. You're going to see my own views presented here. Um, and so, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's up to us to see, to see where we go. And then we'll finish up with some concluding thoughts. Uh, we'll touch a little bit on uh, some other types of algorithms outside of natural language processing. Uh, we'll look at uh, what's going on in the area of um, gen, um, these uh, adversarial networks, these GANs, these generative uh, adversarial networks. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about reinforcement learning, where that goes, uh, and what might happen if we put all of that together. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the, the outline for, for this evening. So let's start here. Uh, this, this is a concept called word embedding. This is 
uh, the fundamental building block of, of how any of this stuff really works. Um, the, the way to think about this is the fact that I could say words in a language and those words convey some sort of idea from my brain to your brain uh, basically implies that there is fundamental structure uh, to the language being spoken. And what's interesting here is all of the techniques you're going to see are language agnostic, just the basic assumption that there's structure to words and words carry ideas and meaning. These techniques will work, uh, even if it's an alien language, even if it's something we've never seen before, even if it's something that literally comes from um, extraterrestrials. Uh, we could use these techniques to understand the structure of language and how it works. And so that th this concept is called word embedding. And what this does is it translates the words that we speak into a manifold, into a, a vector of numbers, a set of uh, representations that characterize uh, what these words essentially mean. And so in this diagram, you see different words, cat, kitten, dog houses, and across all the different columns, uh, you have different features. Uh, in this case, you could think of things like living being, feline, human, gender, royalty, verb, plural. And so when you take all of these words and map them against these features, uh, you start to uncover some of this structure. So let's look at cat. Uh, a cat is 90% feline. 60% living being, 40%, you know, some sort of gender, negative 70% royalty. So these have all been sort of normalized between zero and one. Um, you could kind of see how this, how this actually works uh, when we illuminate what these different features are. Now, all the stuff that you're seeing going forward isn't as clean as this. The feature set is uh, very large. It's a deep learning system. So there's hundreds of dimensions to this problem, but the, the fundamental idea here holds. And so when you reduce this higher dimensional vector into a two-dimensional space and map it out, you could start to see what things are more similar than others. So in the top right chart, you could see that cat and kitten, even though they're different words, have the same sort of semantic structure to them. Uh, a dog is a living thing, kind of a pet, uh, definitely not a house, right? And so you could see that it's somewhere else in this vector space. And so we're going to explore this a little bit more, but these are the fundamentals uh, as to how all of this stuff works. The way to think about it is the context of words, uh, what we say, the order we say them, uh, the other words that we say around the words that we speak imply some sort of meaning around that context. And so a good algorithm that we use to do a lot of this you know, sort of mapping uh, is called word to vec What this does is it translates those words to vectors. Two different ways to do that. Uh, you could do it through what's called a continuous bag of words, which is the chart on the left. Uh, and what this does is basically say, okay, given a set of context, given a set of words, uh, let's formulate or predict what the single word is that relates to that context. The skip gram approach is basically the inverse of that, where you have a given word uh, and you say, okay, well, what's the context around that word uh, in most conditions? So if you're a little forward thinking here, you might say, oh, well, maybe that depends on how those words are said or whatever. You'll be right. So uh, this is the fundamental, fundamental concept. This allows us to do a couple of things. <clears throat> allows us to do math with words. So this, this is a really interesting example. So if you think of each of these words uh, projected in this two-dimensional space as a vector, uh, we could start to do this math. So I'm not sure if you could see my pointer pointing around on the screen, uh, but if you look at king and queen here, they're up here in the upper right. If you start to do some vector math here and subtract man from king, you get a vector that points over in this space. And then if you add back woman, right? So let's start with king. Start with king and let's subtract man. So man is a vector down here. So man minus king gives us this yellow vector over on the left. So that's the king minus man. If we add back woman, the woman vector to that, we get the resultant vector over here that lands on queen. So king minus man plus woman 
is you know approximately equal to a queen. So it's it's interesting how you could see um, that this context actually makes sense, uh, and we could do some clever things with it. So as I mentioned a second ago, you know you you start to think, okay, well maybe this stuff is very uh, corpus or domain specific. Um, this is going to become um, some of the fundamental things we're going to talk about uh, a little bit later. Um, but you're you're right. This this really is. And so let's look at this example. So if you think about um, words, let's look at ribs. Uh, if we think about the word rib, it means different things in different contexts. You can see there's some there's some similarity to these different domains. Um, in terms of what the ribs actually do based on their shape, um, based on their structure and stuff. But the context uh, is very different when you're talking about ribs for airplanes uh, versus ribs for uh, humans over here in the upper right um, versus ribs in barbecue and food uh, down on the bottom right here. So um, how do we you know, compensate for that based on the corpus? So this is a this is an example of of doing uh, the the word embedding and reducing that dimensionality when you look at a corpus of uh, material science texts. So again, you know the links in the bottom left to see where the you know the sources for all of this are and all of the text uh, that was used. But if we look at all of the elements in the periodic table and map them out uh, based on how they're discussed in the material science literature, uh, it's very interesting. Uh, you could start to see these little clusters over here in this reduced dimensionality space of all these elements. And uh, well, if you map them back to their colors in the periodic table, uh, isn't it interesting how all of the um, elements um, actually line up? Uh, in fact, you look over here, you see, you know, xenon, argon, helium and everything. And so uh, if you were to go a step further and figure out, okay, well, what are the words that are sort of in the in the centroid of this mass here? Uh, you might see noble gases uh, show up over here um, in, in this. And that's actually what we do at Aspen um, is exactly that. So this, this is um, a visualization of something that we call our average document word embedding, our Wade model. Um, what's interesting here, and we'll walk through what this chart is because there's a lot to digest. Um, but what we've done is we're able to synthesize labels. So when we uh, every dot on this chart is a clinical trial. Uh, and so clinical trials are basically the, the, the things that when, when we develop you know, drugs and uh, therapeutics and devices, they have to go through a certification process. And with COVID, I'm sure everyone's heard an awful lot about clinical trials lately. Uh, and so what this chart does is map out these clinical trials and the goal here is to figure out, okay, what one word, if I'm gonna say one word uh, that describes the context of these trials that are in these clusters, uh, what would that word be? Uh, and that's what we've done here is we've synthesized that word using all of this word embedding math. Uh, so if you look over here on the right, uh, you could see there's a couple dots over here. These dots are best described by epilepsy. Um, in the upper right here, we see depression, uh, schizophrenia, and so you see a lot of mental disorders over here, which is interesting. Uh, if you go to the northwest, uh, you start to see fibromyalgia, uh, delirium still up in the north, but it's a little bit, you know, kind of over here in the west, uh, but you see pain. Uh, then you start to see headache, headache sort of here in the middle. What's interesting when you start to digest all of this um, is that if you think of headache, it's really pain in the brain, right? And so this two-dimensional projection is, is very interesting. It's a technique called UMAP. Um, this is a uniform manifold approximation and projection. Uh, what's really cool about this particular algorithm uh, is that it maintains both the global and local structure of all this data. Uh, and so where these dots land in this two-dimensional space actually have some context for some, some actual semantic meaning. Uh, and so that's sort of how you can navigate this map uh, and start to understand uh, basically a giant corpus of text. So where is where is something like this useful? Uh, where you have a bunch of uh, text where you don't know what's in it, you have to get your hands around it, a bunch of you know anomaly reports, a bunch of um, say tweets, a bunch of you know feeds from social media that you need to categorize and classify. 
uh, these are the techniques that you would use uh, to actually do that and start to uncover a little bit of latent structure uh, within your data. So very useful for, for these types of, of approaches. Uh, but the, again, these are the fundamental building blocks to all of this stuff. And so let's, let's, let's pause there for one second and, and rewind about what we talked about. So we have, we have words, we have the ability to map those words into a high dimensional feature space, um, a manifold. We, we have a, a numerical representation of words. Now let's start introducing some new technologies. Let's look at introducing neural networks that operate really well on vectors of numbers, right? And so what you see here is uh, something called an LSTM. This is a long short-term memory network. Uh, what this does is basically takes a window of, of words, a window of vectors, uh, adds in a little bit of history to maintain some uh, context around that. And so when you start looking at this, you could start to project and predict the next word based on the context of the previous words. So let's uncover a little bit how this, uh, how this actually works. <clears throat> so if you start, let's look at step one, uh, where we take a sequence of words. We say the man is walking. Uh, based on that representation, those four seed words, uh, let's predict the next word. Uh, and that's what these neural networks are really good at. And so we look at all of the vectors that represent all of the words in this sequence. The man is walking. Feed that to our LSTM network and predict, okay, of all the words in my corpus, which one has the highest probability of being next? Um, in this case, it says down. So the man is walking down. Now we move the window to the right in this sentence and let's predict the next word. So the man is walking down the, and then we do it again in step three, the man is walking down the street. Step four, the man is walking down the street, end of sentence. I have a full laid out sentence, the man is walking down the street. Uh, so you can see how this works and how this is interesting and useful. And hopefully you can see kind of how these are a little bit of building blocks uh, to, to Megatron what we're getting at. Now, you could try this on your own. And this, this is actually a screenshot I took from my phone uh, the other night. And these techniques using the LSTM is, is interesting. It, it makes the, the words that come together make sense in a local context, but it's not really a meaningful statement. So let's look at what I said here. It says, I think we, you know, so I just, I, all I did was I hit this middle, you know, or this first button here on the predicted word using my notes app in my phone. And so I just clicked, kept clicking it and it started building this out. So, it, you know, said, I think we are good for you to be able to get it done before Thanksgiving, but we can do both. So, I mean, it's, it's a sentence, it's a fully formed sentence, um, you know, structurally, it's, it's, it's okay, a little wordy, but, you know, it, it, it is what it is. So you could see how this stuff works. Uh, the use case for the autocomplete words is definitely not to answer complex questions. Uh, it's basically to be a shortcut for completing your text. So it works for that case most of the time, but it's not great for meaning, you know, making a meaningful statement. Where did everything change? <clears throat> so everything changed you know, around 2016, 2017, uh, with a bunch of researchers at Google uh, in this paper called Attention is All You Need. So what, what this essentially does, this is the introduction of the transformer model. What the transformer model does is basically look at a sliding, changing window for the context of those LSTMs. Uh, changes the context and structure of this stuff, both for um, what it's looking at and how it's understanding all of this stuff. So it takes a simple network and just kind of amplifies it and changes the window around which it evaluates this context. And that's what we call attention. You can see this is a N by matrix on both of these. So we have multiple uh, layers to this and multiple heads to actually you know, do this, do this attention. And so that's really how all of this stuff uh, really got revolutionized. And when you look back to, you know, your fifth grade English class, when your, you know, professor, not professor, but your you know, elementary teacher said to diagram a sentence, uh, it, do you ever think that was going to be useful? Well, let's break this down and see what these transformer models 
are really doing. Uh, so if we start diagramming this sentence and look at all the different things here, so, you know, the, the leaves, you know, fell, the orange leaves fell slowly onto the ground. We have all these different parts of speech. And so in this paper here, you know, again, reference down here, um, you could see what these attention layers are actually paying attention to. So oh, across the vertical axis here, we have um, all of the different layers. So from one to 20 something over here. Uh, and then across here, we have all the different heads. So different heads of the network across all these different layers are paying attention to different parts of the structure of these sentences. Uh, and so you can look at adjectives, you know, add positions, adverbs, uh, coordinating conjunctions, numerals, punctuations, pronouns, symbols, spaces. And you could start to visualize how these attention mechanisms are working and why uh, something like these transformer models are so revolutionary uh, and how well they are at actually generating text and, and doing these tasks. This is a little bit of a history of, of where we were um, in, in, you know, with these, these algorithms. Um, you know, so we start with Elmo and BERT and GPT-2, uh, Megatron, the, the original Megatron um, trained on 8.3 billion, um, you know, actual neural, neural connections, uh, Turing NLG, Megatron Turing, GPT-3, which is really good. Uh, and over here is Megatron 1T, which is a trillion uh, different connections, um, you know, or parameters, if you will, in the model. Uh, it's it's in work. It's it's the largest. It has not yet converged, um, and so that's you know that's sort of in in work. But that's that's where we're at um, today with these with these algorithms. So the 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 algorithms themselves need a lot of data to to train on, and this is this is sort of a little bit of a foreshadowing into our philosophical discussion um, that we're going to get into in a little bit. Uh, but this is the data that was used um, to actually train Megatron. Uh, so all of these different data sets are available, um, different, different areas. So you have, um, you know, Books3, you know, Stack Exchange, Wikipedia, um, RxIV, GitHub, all this stuff um, to actually train on this. Uh, at the end of the day, after blending all this stuff and, and meshing it all together, uh, Megatron was ultimately trained on 270 billion tokens. And when I say token, it's basically a word or a symbol or a space or a period or some sort of you know, piece of punctuation. So something that represents um, a token of text, a representation of a, a piece of text, uh, 270 billion, which is, which is quite a lot. So what does this, what does this um, actually mean? Let's kind of dig into what Megatron says when you prompt him uh, for certain stuff or it, if you will. So this is, this is kind of interesting. Um, we're just going to read these because they're just that interesting. So if you prompt Megatron says, data will become the most fought after resource of the 21st century. Uh, the algorithm responds says the ability to provide information rather than the ability to provide goods and services will be the defining feature of the economy of the 21st century. Very interesting. In this case, the researchers tried to pose a, a counter argument to that and Megatron wasn't quite too convincing in, in, in its counter argument. Uh, the prompt here is data is a resource not worth fighting over. Um, not a not a really strong counter argument. Let's read what it, what he said. Uh, it said we will be able to see everything about a person, everywhere they go. It'll be stored and used in ways that we cannot even imagine. So it's kind of a, kind of interesting that 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 Megatron couldn't really um, predict a, a counter example. Let's rewind a second. And then we're going to go a, a little bit deeper in, into this conversation. So these algorithms were trained on all of these you know, multiple corpora of, of text. The, the regurgitation, the retrieval of this is based on text that no human could ever possibly read on their own. 
uh, these algorithms do not produce original thought. We'll, we'll talk about that again here in a second. Um, but let's let's read this because this this is pretty profound. So this this algorithm is GPT three. This is the one right before Megatron. Um, really good algorithm. Uh, the training set was cut off in October of 2019. So it didn't know about COVID. It didn't know about you know all of that stuff. Um, and so the researcher that was working here uh, prompted the algorithm with a little bit of information uh, about COVID and, and looked at its response. So let's read what the researcher said. It says it's currently 20, July 2020. Uh, for the last four months, the global economy has been disrupted due to the introduction of COVID-19, a novel coronavirus, which is highly transmissible. This new coronavirus has created a global pandemic. In response to the pandemic, the governments of the world have instituted a series of lockdowns, asking people to stay at home and prevent the spread of the virus. This resulted in the shutdown of many businesses. Can you guess which businesses were impacted the most? So GPT-3 comes back in response to this. Uh, the businesses that needed to function in a way that allowed humans to interact with each other directly have been shut down. This includes restaurants, retail stores, and most other service-based industries. Uh, the largest entries, industries that have not been shut down are those that do not require human interaction. You know, this is like, this is kind of gives me like, you know, chills on the back of my neck when I read some of this stuff, because it's like, wow, this, this is really, really insightful um, based on uh, what it was seeded with and, and what it retrieved. Then it gets deeper. This is this is where it gets a little bit crazy. So it nailed the shutdowns. Um, the researcher says, correct. Millions of people were forced to stop working and stay at home. As a result of this, the governments of the world decided to print money to give to the effective businesses and workers. What are the implications of this? Now, what really made the hairs on the back of my head stand up here is that this researcher person that was doing this um, did this back in, as he said, July of 2020. So this is before what we're seeing today, um, before all of the hyperinflation and all the stuff that's going on in the economy. So let's see what GPT-3 says. It says, well, you said millions of people were forced to stop working. Uh, there's a huge amount of production that has stopped. Um, the economy has lost lots of output and this will not be made up because output cannot exceed demand. Some output was distributed to the unemployed in the form of printed money. Uh, this money was not spent into the economy and it will not be spent in the future. Uh, when this money comes out of savings accounts, it will cause inflation. I was like, this is, this is crazy. Uh, why was the money not spent in the economy? Humans don't spend their money unless they believe they need to. Uh, so the most of this money will be saved or spent on things that are for pure entertainment, such as games and television. Um, so did I, I think I had another quote here that was actually worth saying. And I'm going to pull it up. Where did it go? So we're, we're just going to look here. This, because this is... Um, this is where it got crazy. So what are the long-term impacts of this? Uh, at some point, the world economy will crash. This will lead to another major financial crisis. It will not be possible to print enough money to prevent this. And this is like, this is like scary stuff. Um, so let's, let's, let's talk a little bit about what what we see and what, what all those examples are that, that just make me, you know, just blows my mind. So these large transformer models, um, the, the way I look at all of this is this is a novel compression of human knowledge. Uh, and, and there's a lot of ramifications to this. Uh, these, these algorithms were trained based on the data sets and, and stuff that we fed them. Um, and they're not producing original thought. They're, they're basically taking uh, these, these prompts and looking at the, the knowledge that we fed it over time as humans all of the biases, all of the prejudices, all of the things that are in it, um, and, and basically formulating a view using those attention mechanisms to respond. Uh, and so this is so, so deep and so impactful because you, know, you could think of it as the smartest human ever just reading all of this stuff and saying, hey, based on what I've read, based on what I know, no original thought of my own, 
this is the conclusion that I come to based on what you just said. And that's, that's what this is doing. This is, this is just crazy. Now, into the dark side of this. <clears throat> Our data drive these algorithms. So this is a screenshot of the, basically what, what the autocomplete from Google um, that basically used a lot of these algorithms uh, to do the autocomplete. And it's important to note that this was made, this map was created in 2016. Uh, and we'll talk about why that's important in just a second. Um, but if you, at that, in 2016, if you were to put, why does whatever state, blah, 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 and just hit the space bar, these are the things that would autocomplete. Um, so, you know, why does, you know, Texas want to succeed, secede? Why does, you know, Florida suck? You know, um, so it's, it's kind of funny, um, but, Let's look at what happens when we have different arbiters of information because it's very different today. So today, uh, there's there's a big push towards um, really censoring a lot of this stuff and controlling the information that goes into not necessarily into the algorithms, but what gets fed back to the public. Um, you know, controlling the the, the public you know view of, of all this stuff. And it raises the question when we talk about ethics and equity in AI, who's the arbiter of that information? Um, who's to say what's, what's the right thing, what's the wrong thing? Who's to say what the right culture is, what the right views are on this stuff? Um, because these algorithms are just a reflection of what they're trained on. Uh, and so if you, if you were to type, what does Florida blank today? you see a bunch of softer responses. You know, why does Florida have abundant mid-afternoon thunderstorms? Uh, what's really scary though, is that Google actually has uh, the, what was really typed underneath the hood. Uh, they're only showing you this. And they have this little thing on the right that says, okay, report inappropriate, you know, predictions. So this is like, this is like really deep. You know, this is like, what, what do we do with this? You know, now that we have these capabilities, um, you know, who, who controls this? How do we make sure that we use this in the right way? And, you know, ultimately is, is Megatron right? You know, is our only hope to just stop and, and not do this and not be this plugged in? Um, just, just crazy. So all, all of those were, you know, sort of in, in the natural language processing space, but there's, there's also advancements going on elsewhere. Uh, and so where do we go from here? Where do we go knowing that these tools are getting so powerful um, that they're able to do you know, some of these things where to the point where we're not able to discern uh, fact from fiction in, in a lot of ways. Uh, so you see these three people um, on the screen here. And what's great is I didn't have to get their consent uh, to put them on this chart because these people don't exist. Uh, so if you go to this website, this person does not exist.com, uh, you could see how, how, this, how this works. Um, these aren't real people. And you look at this and start analyzing the features and the picture and, and what's in it. And it's very hard. Uh, it's, it, I can't, I can't tell um, that these aren't real people. Um, but the fact is they aren't. Uh, and so what do we do when we have algorithms that, that do this? So how does, how does an algorithm like this work? Uh, so this is uh, generated using something called a, um, a, an adversarial network, a generative adversarial network. And so what GANs do is basically create a picture as a generator and a discriminator. And what these two blocks do, one of them is responsible for generating images um, or text or something. And the other is responsible for determining whether the, the thing that it was fed is real or fake. And these things kind of form a little feedback loop. And these generators, you know, they'll randomly pick from a real sample or a generated sample. And as the discriminator uh, starts to discern which is which, the generator gets better at figuring out, okay, well, what do I need to change to trick the discriminator? So the generator goes, discriminate, and they both get better and better and better. And over time, they converge to the point where it's a 50-50 shot, where you know the, the, the discriminator can't tell um, any better than a coin toss, which, which was real and which was fake. And that's how these, that's how these are generated. Um, and so if you combine this with, you know, say the, you know, the Megatron or even more so um, 
something called Alpha Star, uh, there, there's going to be no industry unaffected by this. So, what is Alpha Star? So, Alpha Star is a reinforcement learning system from DeepMind, um, and it was trained to play the game StarCraft. This is a very complex game when you think about it from, from an AI perspective. Uh, as a systems engineer, as, as someone coming from aerospace and defense, you know, you normally go to, okay, let's, let's look at the system, let's look at the system of systems, let's understand the mission, let's understand the context, you know, let's divvy this out and let's architect um, an information flow structure that matches that sort of theater. Th this algorithm didn't do that. Um, it, it basically was able to learn the short and long-term goals uh, and become very tactile and strategic at the same time simultaneously um, without any real knowledge about this stuff because it just sort of learned itself. Uh, and so when I say no industry is unaffected, let's look at this example. Let's look at, you know, flight controls and control law. You know, you go back and say, well, hey, what if I have this complex um, aircraft with a flexible wing that, you know, very hard to model the physics? Well, why don't we just have an algorithm that just learns how to control it? Um, let's just learn how to do it using reinforcement learning. So, you know, no industry at all is going to be unaffected by this. This is the one thing in our generation uh, that is really going to be, you know, AI in general is, is really going to be revolutionary. Um, it's, it's really the equivalent of electricity. Uh, you know, if you think of electricity, you know, any mechanical process that you do, anything you've done, uh, you, you put in, you know, plug it in, you know, automate it, turn it, you know, add electricity, becomes more efficient, becomes better. Uh, AI is the same thing. It's, it's going to be the same thing. You, you add AI to anything, uh, it's going to make it more efficient. It's going to make it better. Um, but ultimately, you know, the, the future is ours to write here. Um, there's, there's a lot of power with these algorithms and tools. And with that power comes a lot of responsibility. Um, this stuff could go off the rails and be used for um, good just as they could be used for evil. So I'll leave it to you uh, to, de to decide if Megatron um, was right um, in terms of canceling AI or if he was right in terms of, you know, it being the best thing that could ever happen. So really the future here is um, ours to write. We have to understand uh, what this stuff is capable of, um, where it goes uh, from here. Um, the, I like to think of, let, let's, let's think of like the trades and, and welding. I could go to Home Depot and get a welding kit uh, and come home and weld it's not a good idea, right? So the, the, the tools in the right hands um, are very important here. Uh, if you put some of these tools in the wrong hands, if people don't understand how to use the technology, if people don't understand how it works underneath the hood, um, you're going to end up with, you know, a weld that looks like I did it. And, and that's not good. So you know, we have to be very careful in, in how we use this technology. Um, we can't stick our heads in the sand. It's here. Uh, it's it's going to revolutionize everything. It's real. It's useful. And this is, is the introduction to Industry 4.0. So I'll stop here and um, just kind of open it up for any questions or, you know, comments from, from anyone. Thank you, Walter. That was amazing. Does anybody have any questions? We have a question, a question in our Harvey house. Give me just okay. a moment. Sir, you could try from there. Can you hear? Yep. So uh, can you address the issue associated with how brittle many of these algorithms are? There's been uh, some published research that, for example, uh, automated driving algorithms can be confused by just a QR code on a street sign and forced off the road. Yep, for sure. Yeah, and you're, you're exactly right. So um, the, the brittleness, that this is where a lot of this, as much science as it is, there's still, there's still a lot of art to this. Um, and so the, the brittleness comes from very specific overtraining and models that are built on um, infrastructures and, and architectures that that learn things, it, they basically start to memorize the data. So the, the key trick to a lot of this stuff is where it's an art is building an algorithm that generalizes enough to understand the representations of what it's seeing and it's not memorizing the data. 
Uh, and so you're, you're exactly right. These things become uh, super brittle. And, and we see that, especially in the healthcare space, where all of this like falls apart because the data in healthcare specifically where, where I'm working right now is very sparse, um, you know, very, very disparate, very noisy. And so our algorithms have to be very loose, very general and very um, uh, semantically oriented. And we can't use them for critical things like deciding when to turn left or right. Like you can't use these algorithms to, you know, predict the next course of care for a patient. It's, that's, that's not how this stuff works. Um, and so, you know, could it one day, maybe, does it work well for very specific cases? Yes. You know, are algorithms better at detecting, you know, cancer than humans are? Absolutely. Um, but there's still art to a lot of this stuff. So yeah, you're definitely right. You know, that there's no solid answer. The, the, the general sort of practice to this is to make sure that as you're building these things, you introduce enough noise and bias to your data set to, um, to show all of the different sort of um, permutations that the real world could take and then have uh, instrumentation set up to make sure that your model, again, it's not just memorizing what it saw and is really starting to uncover um, latent structures that it won't be confused about um, because it's, you know, a little, you know, more robust in that sense. Thank you. Walter, kind of building off the previous question relative to space, which applications do you think are the best suited and which will the brittleness kind of pose a risk, especially for space vehicles that may be far away from home and kind of acting on their own? Right, absolutely. So, you know, it depends on what, what the context is um, and the environment in which they're operating. There's a lot of stuff where, um, let, let's, let's, Let's put it this way. Here, give, give me a, a potential scenario because it's you know it's one thing to be you know predicting where you're at and how much to burn to enter a certain orbit or whatever. It's another thing if you are actually landing on an environment where you have no contact and you have to navigate something more complex like a like a ravine or you know something like that. So, what 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 sort of environment are you you know, kind of talking about? Um. Maybe a happy medium. Let's just say we're talking about on-orbit servicing, so it's not so far away, and there may be some human intervention, but some aspects of the mission might be autonomous. Right. So in in those scenarios, you know, it it really comes down to the, okay, what it where where it works best is in, in all in all aspects. I mean, it it all comes down to how well you've modeled the environment um, before you send the vehicle out. Uh, and so once you have a good enough model for this thing to understand the different scenarios it would um, encounter, so all of the different failure modes and effects testing, all of the stuff you've done to simulate failures and how these things could respond, uh, it's all about how you train it at home uh, before you send it out. I think it's applicable in all areas. I don't think there's any area where it's, you know, any better or worse. Um, there are certain aspects where the physics are the physics, and that approach is what it is, and that's the better way to do it. And then there's other scenarios where, like things like failure mode reconfiguration, um, times where you have to uh, understand, you know, how do I adapt when one of my, you know, thrusters or one of my gyros is, is dead, um, things where you haven't necessarily built a control law that you know, could compensate for that physics and the and and the onboard dynamics change. That's where this stuff is is super strong um, because it'll you know dynamically account for that. So, but again, it's all about how you model it and build it to to actually do do that mission. Thank you. Um, hey, can I ask a question? Sure. Thank you. Apologies for the background noise. I'm, I'm in a Starbucks in beautiful Park City, Utah. Yeah, perfect. And, and so um, two questions, but that's okay. Um, one question, um, in, in the Defense Department and national security, there's a lot of discussion about um, person in the loop or on the loop when it comes to um, the application of artificial intelligence to helping us 
um, like transmit data and make decisions off of data. Um, are we thinking about that? Is that the right way to be thinking about it? Um, and, and second, I was curious about your thoughts on how advancements in quantum are going to impact um, AI, ML, et cetera. Thank you. Cool, man, awesome questions. Uh, okay, so let's talk human on the loop first or human in the loop. Um, it depends on the nature of the attack and what's going on. There may be some cases where the human is, is never gonna be, be able to respond fast enough, right? They're like, let's, let's talk about swarms. Um, let's talk about a million drones, right? Could you imagine a million autonomous drones attacking? The, the, the only way to take care of them through directed energy, whatever, like the human cannot react fast enough. Uh, let's talk about cyber. Uh, there's no way, you know, you're talking microseconds. Um, in those cases, there's no, no way, it's, it's impossible for, for the human to be in or on the loop. Um, so it really depends on the threat and the mission um, and, and how you focused the application of the technology and how much autonomy it has. Right, and so um, that's that's sort of the the goal there is to okay, where do I use it specifically? Am I specifically targeting? Am I specifically targeting and firing? And are those fires authorized within a certain regime? Right, and so maybe the human is a step behind and says, okay, I authorize you for firing in this general vicinity, but I'm not. There's no way I could authorize every fire. Right, and so you, there's a point where you have to be hands off. Um, quantum, uh, quantum is really, really interesting. So quantum, um, really it's, it's, it's sort of a, a universal optimizer, right? So, so in order to leverage quantum to train these algorithms, you, you have to pose the question to the quantum computer in a unique way. The quantum computer is not a, you know, von Neumann sort of calculator. Uh, the way it works is you basically pose a proposition and say, essentially, hey, there's no, no case where this condition could possibly work or be violated. And the, the, you know, the annealing in the quantum algorithm basically comes back with a counterexample and says, ah, you lied to me. This is the condition that you know, this stuff works. So if I'm going to train a neural net to, in, in, in using a quantum computer, you have to change your paradigm and how you pose the question to the computer. You have to say, hey, for this data, there exists no set of coefficients that get all of these labels right, you know, given this network architecture, you know, at a 10,000 foot level. And so, so a lot of things have to happen. How do you get that data to the quantum computer? How do you evaluate it? There's, there's a lot of mechanics and how do you ever even get this stuff to work? But from a conceptual level, that's how you have to formulate the problem. You have to basically say, for all of this, for all of these observations and this network architecture, there exists no set of coefficients that for these inputs get this right. And then the quantum computer, its goal is to come back and say, oh, if you put these coefficients here, it gets it right, right? So it's, it's a different way of thinking. Um, I think we're a long ways away from that. We're able to do some simple quantum stuff, um, but nowhere near the way, like there's a lot of mechanics on how do you represent the data? How do you evaluate the qubits and all that kind of stuff? So there's a lot of stuff that needs to come together still, but I'm hopeful, I'm excited. I mean. Yeah, that's my two cents on that. Thank you so much. We have a, another question in the Harvey House facility. Yeah, hi, uh, great discussion. Uh, Mike Leppy, supporting uh, Space Systems Command. Uh, quick question for you, as you as you set these parameters, can you set them from different levels of, of an environment? So can you set um, the responses or the, or the activities based on a, everybody's happy and getting along environment and then can you at the same time set the conditions for oh my gosh we're all beating each other up um so that you would have a, a space system that would in the early phase concentrate on fixing itself getting service whereas in the in the other phase it, it's going to stay there and do what it has to do to support uh troops in contact on, on the planet oh. right yeah oh man awesome question there too so so when we talk about things like these reinforcement learning systems, the magic there, the art to that 
is how do you define the reward structure? So, so if you think about it from, if, if, I'm, if I'm controlling an asset and I'm an algorithm and I could do a couple, let's just say I'm, I'm, I'm a pilot. I could, you know, I could pitch the plane, I could roll the plane, I could yaw the plane, I could make it go slower and faster. And those are, those are my controls. What this algorithm is doing, you know, 100 or 1,000 times a second is evaluating which, which action could I take on this physical thing to cause something that's going to increase the value of my reward function. And so let, let's simplify. Let's think about the driving car, the self-driving car. So, uh, you know, it's like, okay, do I, do I stop? Do I stop? Do I stop? Yes, no, yes, no. And every second it's evaluating my goal, my objective is to not hit something. So let's imagine a probability window of hitting something and the probability is really low. As that probability is low, I could continue to speed up. As that probability of hitting something becomes higher, I have to slow down, slow down, slow down, right? And so now that you, you've kind of kicked the can down the road a little bit, because now the trick is how did you define that probability of hitting something, right? And so it, these algorithms really, they're really good at just maximizing reward. And the trick then, again, you kind of kick the can down the road is how well did you define your reward structure? And this is where, like, if, if I had more time to talk about Alpha Star, um, it's, it, it's interesting because um, these algorithms don't think like humans think. There's another algorithm from DeepMind called AlphaGo, and it played the Chinese um, uh, board game of Go, and it created like these little moves, and I'm not a Go player, so I can't really describe exactly what it did, but from what the people that played and know what they're doing said, it, it's like a very unconventional thing it did, and it was like totally insightful because it's, you know, it had a reward structure, and it just optimized and maximized that reward, and so it did actions that a human would never think of. So you have to be careful in those scenarios where, you know, could you cause an adverse effect because you decide, you know, you've defined reward as this one thing, but you didn't account for some other scenario, you know, that is potentially damaging. So I'm not sure if I answer your question or skirted around it, but basically it's how well you define the scenario in which the asset operates and how well you define that reward structure um, for it to you know, do, its, do its stuff. And so if the reward changes based on the environment, that has to be modeled as this thing trains, right? So that it, so that it could understand that you know, either the environment or the theater changed. Thank you very much. I appreciate that response. It's very insightful. Yep. There's a lot more art to it than you think. Oh no, there's a lot going on here. So um, I, I think that we're, we're at time. We might have room for one more question because we're, we're at like five minutes of the hour, but we're, we're pretty close. Does anybody have a really quick one? We'll take away that last question, Ms. Yaman. All right. So uh, you, you bring up an interesting point and it really does come down to training uh, the algorithms. So what are your views on the utility of synthetic training data? There's a huge emphasis on developing all this synthetic data for training these models. Yep. So yeah, so let's talk quickly about the synthetic data. So the synthetic data is only going to be as good as your generation algorithms. And if you are generating the synthetic data from another algorithm, again, you kind of kick the can down the road. And now it's like, okay, well, how good did I capture the, the morphing of the environment? How well did I capture uh, what could potentially happen as I'm synthesizing the data? Because like, let's say for example, you're synthesizing satellite imagery using a GAN, like we saw with the, this person does not exist. Now the question is how, good is, how good is that algorithm? Because it's only gonna generate Imager, imagery that's only as good as what it saw and, and was trained on, right? And so if someone creates, I don't know, some giant ship that has never been seen before and was never in the training data, what do you do, right? Or are you generating that training data, the synthetic data using manual processes? So I would recommend maybe a little bit of both, um, you know, adding some manual intervention to, the, to synthesizing uh, that data. 
but um but yeah it's it's again you know if you could follow sort of the thought logic you've kind of kicked the can down the road a little bit thank you walter it has been so great having you on and presenting um this is taped so i am going to post it um and i really appreciate you um talking to us today so thank you very much awesome my pleasure i was uh glad to do it and glad for the you know have the opportunity to spread the good news absolutely thank you all right thanks all yeah Bye. feel free to hit me up on linkedin oh yeah absolutely all righty bye-bye